hello. Thank you all for joining us today as part of this panel discussion on gender equity and diversity in STEM. Uh, my name is Christine Smith, and I'm an acquisitions editor at DeGroyter, who is hosting the event along with um, Berlin Science Week. So yeah, thank you. So, sorry if you hear my cat in the background. Uh, thank you so much for coming today, and um, I just want to give some uh, housekeeping before we get started. Um, so all questions should be submitted through the chat. At the end, we should have about 15 minutes left to go through those, uh, time depending. Uh, we do have some um, closed captioning today for those who are hard of hearing. Um, I will put that uh, link in the chat now. Uh, as well, you might see um live streaming available at the top um can't seem to get where the chat is i'll put it in kevin can you put it in again the link just copy and paste again thank you um i'm quickly going to run through who we have with us today we're going to go into some questions and um yeah get things started so without further ado uh so our panelists today consist of dr clemens striving who is a senior researcher at the Fraunhofer Center for Responsible Research and Innovation. Uh, we have Professor Lucy Campbell, an associate professor from Carleton University in Canada. We have Professor V. Dong, a professor fra in chemistry um, from the University of California at Irvine. We have Dr. Sandra Kerbler, or Sandy as you see in her uh, username, uh, who is a postdoctoral fellow from the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Plant Physiology. We have Sarah Moistler, a PhD candidate from Freie Universität here in Berlin. And we have Sonja Joost, who is CEO of Dexelchem, a, a company here in Berlin. Um, and just for the information of all participants, other than uh, Clemens, the rest of us here today are not researchers in equity and diversity. We're gonna be talking mostly from our shared experience living as diverse peoples in STEM. Um, and that's where most of our experience is coming from. So just wanted to disclose that at the beginning. Okay, so we're going to get into the questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen just so everyone can see everyone a bit more clearly. Excellent. Um, and yeah, so we'll get to our first question, which is, what are the chief obstacles in your organization, institute or field to achieving gender uh, equality and diversity. Um, and one second also, I almost forgot before we get into answering that, I wanted to say when I'm talking about equity, what I really mean is giving everyone equal access to things. So not that we should all have equal access, but equal opportunities. And not everyone has the same opportunities from the beginning because of issues around uh, diversity coming to race, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, um, gender identity, socioeconomic background, the list goes on. Um, and yeah, so that's what I'm meaning when I'm saying equity in terms of uh, gender equity and diversity. Yeah. So yeah, what are the chief obstacles in your organization or institute? And have you personally experienced issues with these obstacles? Um, I'm just going to start it off a bit random, seeing who I see on my screen. So, Sarah, do you want to begin with this question? Is that all right? Excellent. I'm going to put myself on mute now. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Christine, for having me here today, um, especially as a representative of my group, LGBTQ STEM Berlin, which I co-founded last year. And um, yeah, so I'm kind of going to try and focus a bit on a queer perspective on these issues today even though I think it's essential when, uh, yeah, on this road to achieving gender equality and diversity to always have a intersectional perspective in mind, as you kind of already mentioned. So I think it's really essential to always keep in mind that people uh, experience discrimination, not only on, based on their gender, but also on their, based on their sexual orientation, on their race, on disabilities, as well as social economic background. Um, yeah, so STEM fields in general, and specifically also physics, the field that I work in, is still a very, uh, very masculine typed, uh, has a very masculine typed work culture as well as masculine typed behavioral norms that go hand in hand with kind of, um, well, with heteronormativity. And universities, um, at least German universities in my experience, are not really doing much to change this. 
So um, an example from my department is um, that we actually do have a, a, a physics, a women in physics networking group that two undergrad students uh, started a few years ago, which is great. And also um, yeah, senior scientists and professors join this group and support this group. But as I said, it was founded by these undergrad students. And I think it, like, it's an amazing group and it's just great, but I think it, it would be so important to have also more push from an institutional level, from the university itself and from the department to kind of push for change and diversity and not yet yeah, rely on yeah, the motivation of students to do this. Um, and yeah, so another issue that is directly concerning career diversity, diversity specifically is uh, visibility or rather invisibility. So studies have shown that people in STEM fields are less likely to come out at work. And if they do come out, they are less likely to feel comfortable and safe compared to other work fields. And um, this kind of leads to a lack of role models, queer role models in science, and also a lack of, um, or a feeling of, of not fitting in. And um, yeah, so, and, and connected to this is also the issue that there's really no one responsible, at least not in my university or my department, no one responsible for um, dealing with these issues or no one responsible if there's a case of homophobia or also a case of racism or ableism, there's no one really responsible to dealing with this. We do have a, um, a gender equality officer, but her, at least officially, her job is not to deal with these things. And I think it would be essential to have someone who's um, qualified to deal with these issues and um, yeah, and who's just also responsible for these things. And so in general, I think it would be really important for universities to tackle all these issues on a more systemic level and not rely on individuals and their motivation and drive to change things. Yeah, I think that's really, really important. Awesome. Let's go to our next panelist on my screen. That's Sandy. Would you like to answer the question? Hi, everyone. Um, so um, one of the main obstacles um, at my institute, which is the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Plant Physiology, is actually the Harnack Principle. So the Harnack Principle is where you take some of the best and brightest minds of, in science and you basically build a department or sometimes even an institute around this person. So they have absolute control of what happens in that area and it's the epitome of academic freedom. However, it kind of has a dark side and that's um, if they don't, if these people don't value um, some of the things such as gender equity and diversity, it can be extremely difficult to change some of these um, practices in our institutes. So um, my motivation today is not actually um, to um, point out all the, the bad things that are happening at my institute, but actually to provide a little hope for people, um, particularly women in science who may be struggling right now. Um, this year has been incredibly difficult for everyone. Um, and despite all of the chaos in our world, um, some really wonderful things are actually happening. And I want to definitely point that out tonight. So, um, for example, at, at, within the Max Planck Society, we now have um, a postdoctoral network called the PostdocNet, um, which um, is really um, helping to lobby on behalf of postdocs um, at a much higher level um, to sort of central head office um, itself to, to really create change. But also um, on a much glo on a much bigger scale, on a global scale, I'm, I'm also really lucky to be part of a program called Homeward Bound which is a global um, leadership and strategy program, um, um, which is all about um, increasing the visibility and impact of women scientists. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that more today. Um, to follow up from your question, Christine, I don't think I've really experienced discrimination just because I'm a woman um, at my institute anyway, um, but I definitely have um, experienced some discrimination because of my ethnicity, my culture, and also my age. Um, so, and unfortunately, this is actually quite widespread in, in, in the Max Planck. So it's really great that we have that postdoc net society now and um, some really good things are gonna happen. Thanks. Awesome, very interesting to hear that your experiences on discrimination don't come from gender, but actually intersections within your yeah, own personal experience. Okay, next on, on my screen is Sonia. Do you want to go ahead and answer the question? Yes, sure. Um, 
I thought about um, we are all people working in STEM, so I would like to um, ask everyone to do a little experiment with me. So um, I would like um, everyone to close your eyes. Yeah, please close your eyes and um, breathe deeply, think about nothing, and then please think about startups. And then think about a CEO. And then think about engineers. And now open your eyes again. And I think you have already seen what the obstacles are that I am facing. Because I think probably no one of you have, have, have seen someone like me. Yeah, I'm an engineer, I'm a CEO, and um, I have uh, also founded a startup. So, um, yeah, in the field of chemistry, of green chemistry, green chemistry um, exactly. Um, and it's um, very unusual to have uh, chemistry startups at all. And it's more unusual to have a woman in such a position. And I think um, it's also um, a, a big problem what kind of role models we see in the um, startup scene, in the television. If, uh, um, for example, in, in Germany, um, it's very easy to get a certain attraction in, um, in the press. Um, for, for a woman, um, but with um, startups like, yeah, I've built a platform to sell um, blossoms, for example, or um, kitchen stuff or whatever, yeah. But I have the impression no one wants to see a female engineer. <laughs> Why ever? So um, the thing that one has in, in, or people have in their heads, also journalists, is that a nerd is male, maybe has um, obstacles, whatever. Um, but it's very difficult for me to explain that I'm also a nerd. <laughs> yeah, even if I maybe do not look like people would like me to look like. So um, this is um, on one side, um, very difficult to handle this. And um, to the part of the question, if I have, um, um, person, uh, if I have, uh, is it uh, this question if I have personal yeah, if you have experienced experience, uh, issues? I think I um, I have been um, discriminated in, in my life a lot, but I'm not sure why. Yeah, so I, I think there are a lot of um, red bottoms that I could have <laughs> uh, um, turned on. For example, I come from a working class family. Yeah, no one in my family um, has ever, uh, 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 yeah, ever went uh, to a university at all before. So um, I am female. I also my my background is not um, that I have uh, completely German um, parents. Um, so there's a lot of <laughs> um, stuff why I could have um, been discriminated. I also speak out loudly what are my opinions. A lot of people have problems with this too. So um, actually, I don't know why. Um, and I also don't care why people discriminate others. I do not care at all. Yeah, um, I try always to find a way to handle it. And um, yeah, I think um, this is uh, the most, the most um, important way to speak out loudly if something happens, and um, yeah, to to identify if um, there's a wall. Um, you you should not try to yeah to run against the wall again and again. So yeah. find a way, another way to to go around. Yeah. I find it really interesting because I'm not often thinking about the discrimination, like I think about the discrimination in academia specifically, and I think about it in industry at a larger scale, but not so much the startup scene. Um, yeah, I think your perspective is going to be really, really great today. Clemens? Yeah, um, well, also, if, 
oh, sorry, um, just, um, uh, to, to add uh, something, even if it comes to the axis of um, uh, capital, yeah, mm -hmm. capital is power, and um, a lot of people do not want to share power, and mm -hmm. it's very unusual if you, um, well, in general, women pitch differently to yeah. investors than men. And um, if uh, maybe a, a good-looking woman comes comes along, um, people are not very used to have um, yeah that they also have a um, strong opinion. Yeah. yeah, and there are a lot of difficult dynamics that can occur. But I think it's very crucial that women also get access to capital because um, yeah. we also have access to power. Yeah, so, yeah. I agree. Well, we'll hear more about that later. Clemens, would you like to go ahead and answer the first question? Um, yeah, of course. Um, let me add one more point to what Sonia said. I, say, I think from a um, scientific standpoint, this sounds like the, the typical experience. So there in Germany, I think there are only 15% uh, uh, women in the startup scene. And um, also, there are a number of studies that women are punished for behaving against their gender stereotypes in a male way, and that uh, women are more punished the more that they climb up the uh, career ladder. Um, yeah, I was growing gray hair about the question because it's a very general one, and um, I try to uh, approach it by defining some problem fields or problem areas, and I think we have. Uh, yeah, we have made only continuous but only slow progress in some STEM fields. In others, we have meanwhile stagnation since 10 years. I would think IT is such a field. Um, we have extreme uh, gender segregation in vocational trainings, which is an important field in uh, Germany. Uh, startup field, I already said, and also private um, research and development. For example, in uh, automobile industry, we've got only about 10% of engineers um, that are female. Um, yeah, I think it's a wicked problem. Uh, it's not going to be solved by telling uh, young girls to be more interested in STEM, and it's not going to be solved by telling organizations to have more work-life balance. Um, and I think we can only make progress in the pace society makes progress. Um, so as long as society is reproducing uh, differentiated gender roles, we also will reproduce our stereotypes um, again and again. And then uh, yeah, men are uh, ascribed to a corporate and technology sphere and women uh, to a domestic and social sphere. Um, but maybe we can talk about this later. I'm quite uh, optimistic that society is making progress also in a slow pace. Awesome, thanks so much. Lucy, you're next on my screen. Would you like to go ahead and answer the question? Um, yeah, so the challenges I would start off uh, speaking about would be not so much unique to my university, but maybe more to my field. So I'm an applied mathematician uh, who does research in essentially physics problems, the physics of the atmosphere, fluid dynamics of the atmosphere, geophysical fluid dynamics. So um, as a mathematician, um, well, that's an area just like others have mentioned, engineering and um, physics where um, there are well, very few um, women, not so much at the um, student level. So there are now larger numbers of women, under, especially at the undergrad level um, in Canada. And I think that's true in many other parts of the world as well. Um, but of course, the numbers decrease as you go up the ladder towards the ceiling. Um, and um, uh, so there are a lot of women undergrad students in math, far fewer grad students, and then uh, fewer uh, assistant professors and so on. Um, also within ma uh, applied math, the specific area I work on, applications towards physics, there are far fewer women than say mathematical biology, which seems to have more women. So in Canada, I would say I'm one of a very small number of women in this area. I, I hardly, almost never meet any others um, at conferences. 
Um, and the same would be true for the atmospheric sciences conferences that I go to, mostly junior women, but very few senior ones. So for my, uh, just looking at it from my perspective, it means that I don't really have, or I have never really had women uh, role models as I was going, try, trying to make my way up, um, to make my uh, progress up the ladder. Um, almost no women uh, role models. Um, and um, that would be true for most younger women academics um, also. Um, there are um, the main obstacles I've faced myself personally would be issues related to say parenting and so on where I might have um, less um, um, time and um, maybe not a completely even playing field as a result compared with my, uh, some of my uh, male colleagues. Um, and um, in general, um, just interacting with um, people at uh, conferences and so on, people who might not know me, um, I experience sort of not outright discrimination, but the kind of microaggressions like people that meet me and assume I'm a student. If I, um, even though my, I have quite a lot of gray hair, I'm assumed to be a student uh, because it's, you know, many people would not, not just in academia, but anyway, if I meet someone on the street and I say I'm a prof at Carleton University, or I'm, I'm at, if I meet anyone on the street and I, uh, they would assume, first of all, assume I'm a student on campus. And if they know I'm a prof, if I say I'm a prof, it's a, no one would assume I'm a math professor. They would assume assume I must be a professor of whatever, music or sports or some of the activities that black people are assumed to do. Um, so um, I do experience sort of some of the, many of the microaggressions that, well, in general, black people tend to experience living in North America, as well as um, the uh, maybe some discrimination as, uh, as a woman in a STEM field where there are very few women. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I think we really don't take these microaggressions as seriously as we should because this eats away at a person. Yeah, so, so you tend to, you experience them and sometimes you are maybe you're so used to it, you don't even notice it's happening all the time. Uh, and or you might not know what other people's experiences are. So you, there are times where you might experience some issues and you might think, well, maybe the, everyone else is going through this. And then it might take some thought to realize that or maybe talking to someone else to find out that, oh, I'm, you know, I'm the one they're doing that to. They don't do it to other people. So it's, it, there's a reason for that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I think, yeah, we have one more panelist to hear from. V, would you like to go ahead and answer the question? Oh, I it's think you're muted. muted. <laughs> I should mute myself. Great, uh, thanks, Christine, and thanks everyone for the input. I, I joined today uh, mostly because I was really excited to meet all of you and learn more about you know this really, really important challenge that everyone's interested in contributing to. Um, I guess, you know, um, I guess I'm the only one maybe calling in from the US. So right now it's sort of an exciting and hopeful time for us. We have a change in leadership and that was, a, I think seeing Kamala Harris elected as the first woman vice president was really a big uh, win for women all over the country. And so when I think about, you know, at my own institution, maybe compared to some things that Sandy and Sarah and Sonia mentioned, um, I, I think we're sort of lucky in the US, especially at a university that's a public university in California. There is, uh, you know, like offices in place and initiatives in place to kind of address these issues. And so we might be a little ahead in, in that way. Um, and I know Canada is pretty, pretty open and I, I spent many years there as a professor. Um, but I would say that the challenge that we still face is the willingness for people to accept the status quo because oftentimes you know you're living in california you got to where you did maybe you had to fight through some struggles but you got where you did and i find that oftentimes you know when i bring up something that's like you know i don't think this is right we should change this it's really easy for someone to say well just try to get along better with people or just you know work hard keep your head down keep going you'll do it 
And I think that we need to realize that wh wh wherever we are in our position, right, whether you're just a teaching assistant and an undergraduate student approaches you and feels like they haven't been treated fairly or they're discriminated against, or if you're a PI and your student sort of brings up an issue, you know, instead of brushing things aside and just saying, just learn to get along with people, you know, just work hard and do your job and you'll be fine. And I find that to be true of chairs and deans and university officials, right? When people take that courage, like Sonia said, it's hard to sort of be outspoken sometimes and actually raise an issue. When people take that courage to do that, I think it's our job to really listen and see how we can contribute and help affect change. And so for me, I think, you know, we have these things in place, but as long as people are pretty happy with their status quo, they're not gonna be willing to uh, help empower other people who don't have the same access that some of us do. And I think that that happens too when you fought through so many things that you think that's just the way it is and everyone should just kind of have to fight through it. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's what I feel would be, I think a more willingness to try to experiment with doing things to make the world a more equitable and inclusive space. Yeah, I think that's so important to bring up. So many times I'll approach people about this topic and they'll say, oh no, we have equality now. Like that's a problem from the past. And it's just simply not true. And, and trying to convince others that we still have work to do is, is really, really difficult in this area. So thanks so much for that. Okay, I think we're ready to go on to our second question now where we're gonna discuss what what can people do? What actionable items can we bring forward that may bring about real change in this area? I'm going to read it out for what I sent the panelists ahead of time. So yeah, what concrete steps can leaders in your organization, institute, or field do to increase gender equity and diversity? I'm going to switch up the order this time just so we don't have the same people going uh, first all the time. So maybe if we want to begin with uh, Clemens. Do you want to go ahead and answer this question? I feel like it's yeah, yeah, getting yeah. called on by the teacher, but. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think one of the most important points is, uh, important point is about leadership, that leaders are not getting tired of showing commitment uh, to these issues because leaders are role models. Everybody in an organization is looking uh, how they behave, even if they, um, smile in a meaningful way when sensitive issues are discussed so you really have to act as a role model i think um, and i think uh, most of the problems start uh, when uh, children come into play so with uh, parenthood a lot of gender segregation mechanisms are starting so uh, leaders or personal or hr management signaling uh, to female uh, to, to women and to men uh, both uh, that they are open um, if the person wants to take long parental leaves uh, um, if uh, the person has issues how to organize children and child care this is already a big help um, i think uh, also contracting with child care faci facilities that allow for an eight hour work day which is in, also in germany uh, not not the rule uh, is helpful and from an organizational perspective, I think, uh, yeah, increasing the visibility of women as part uh, of the STEM fair. Um, yeah, maybe not only from an organization uh, standpoint, but also in don't know, com commercials on Netflix, uh, job advertisements. Um, as long as I'm uh, doing commercials with my cars running around a mountainside with a gray haired guy sitting in it. I don't have to wonder why there are not enough uh, women approaching me for a job in my uh, organization. Um, so there are a number of points, but uh, I will concentrate on this. Thanks. Awesome. I think, yeah, this concept of being visibly open is really important. Actually, I was on Twitter today and I saw it was an old memo that uh, Joe Biden had sent to his um, employees saying, please do not come and work uh, when you have family commitments, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Stu Cantrell um, had retweeted this as like academia, listen up, take note here, and, and just signal to your employees that you are open for a work-life balance and to work with them on these topics. So I think, yeah, that's a great point, Clement. Uh, next, why don't we hear from uh, Sandy? Do you want to answer the question? So 
um, my advice to leaders is simply to educate yourselves and be active and involved. So this goes very much back to what V just mentioned in the way that there's often this culture of, of I did it, so why can't you? And um, instead of brushing off people's concerns and, um, and complaints, I think leaders need to take more of an active role to um, inform themselves of what the issues really are and, and what they can do to, to, to help with this. Because it's not just the, the actions of those at the bottom, those of the workers, um, uh, it's also we need top-down approach as well to have a fully um, um, sort of to have action from both ends basically to create real change and that also relates back to um, something that Sarah mentioned right at the beginning as well. So um, yeah often like leaders um, if it's not their issue then they don't really pay attention to these things um, and so um, yeah, basically, we need to encourage our leaders to be active in these roles. Um, and um, I think everyone would, would benefit. Well, I know that if I saw my, um, my leader in a unconscious bias training program, that would just benefit um, everyone and um, would give a lot of um, hope to a lot of people. Um, because it also gives people permission then to, to kind of openly talk about these issues more within their institutes. If they see their leaders sort of taking an active role, then, then maybe they will too. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Awesome. Yeah, I think then it comes, I saw there was a question in the chat that we'll get to later, but it comes into this idea of, well, we're all talking to each other. We're already interested in this idea. How do we communicate this to leaders to get them to participate in those types of trainings? It might be something we'll talk about a bit more later. Um, next, why don't we hear from V. Would you like to go ahead and answer the question? Hey, Christine. So it seems like my camera is kind of lagging, which might be distracting. <laughs> um, yeah, so from my perspective, definitely, uh, you know, what Sandy said, our leaders, the recognition that um, excellence is something that's very, like, hard to define in some ways. And to me, it's easier for us as scientists to kind of agree on something objective. Like if you can see that every single person who's been, you know, a professor in your department comes from a certain race or sex, right? Then there's obviously some type of misjustice there that can be addressed. And so I think that recognition and that interest in making science more inclusive and equitable is like a first step, right, for everyone. Um, the other thing I would say is just maybe more compassion all around. I feel like if we all could just exercise more compassion for what other people are going through and as well as self-compassion. And so, you know, it's hard to say why maybe it's lack of representation um, and all the different types of, you know, discrimination that various people have experienced. But I would say to people in STEM who want to pursue it and sometimes feel discouraged, have a lot of compassion for yourself and make sure that you're your own best cheerleader. I feel like as a mentor, I often have to, uh, you know, remind my students that you're, you might be being too hard on yourself and to give yourself the same pep talk you would your best friend oftentimes to get through tough times and to get to your goals. Great. Awesome. Yeah, I think so often we're conditioned to kind of feed into that imposter syndrome and get down on ourselves and to give ourselves room to breathe and room to evolve in this topic and also within our own research separate from this topic is really important. Lucy, would you like to go next to answer this question? Yeah, so I was going to uh, make a very similar comment to um, what uh, Sandy said. So I would agree with her point that um, the, the change has to come from um, the leaders uh, and the, the uh, academic communities. And so there has to be a bit of a top-down approach as well, because um, there's only so much that we, the people who are involved in like day-to-day -day work with students and so on can do. Um, they, um, so at my university, Carleton University, and at, I think many others in Canada, there are um, women in science and engineering groups with um, organizations with um, undergrad students and some faculty members sometimes involved and so on. But I think, um, and that's great, but I think that there needs to be uh, also more sort of concrete um, um, 
sort of concrete programs in place. Um, uh, at the undergrad and grad or uh, student level, there may be a lot of opportunities for women, and there may not be that. As th although there are there are some inequities, um, I think that the inequities may be increased as um, um, for faculty members and so on. So for example, in Canada, the, the Natural Sciences Engineering Research Council, NSERC, which provides funding and so on um, um, for uh, research and scholarships, um, has, you, well, used to have a program in place where they would, um, they would um, give a salary contribution and reduced uh, contribute towards a re reduced teaching load for new fa women faculty members. I actually benefited from this program years ago. Uh, so um, the, I think that um, there needs to there need to be a few more programs of that top, um, type in place, which provide concrete um, help to sort of even the playing field. Also, maybe more funding for mentoring programs um, for. To, to provide mentoring to young faculty members and um, maybe grad students and undergrad students. Yeah, I think that's so, so important to, we really need government organizations who are mm -hmm. providing funding to put the money where their mouth are, like to yeah. really fund and provide equitable services so that we do all have an equal playing field. Because I would mention that the, the, the fellowship I just mentioned that I had when I first yeah. started off as a faculty member, I, um, the, the program is actually, was actually cancelled at some point. I'm not sure if they replaced it by anything else, but mm -hmm. they, it, it no longer exists. So, uh, but I did benefit from it and at, at the time when I started off as a new faculty member and I also took maternity leave very shortly after that. So that affected my progress through like getting tenure and all that. And so having this program, um, an award from this program really helped me with my reduced teaching load and therefore having more time to do research and so on. Uh, I'm lucky to live in Canada where we have very generous um, parental leave, but even then still I found I, the, the program like this was helpful yeah but now yeah. it no longer exists i'm not sure if they replaced it with something else mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah the the concept about parental leave applying globally mm -hmm. is wildly inconsistent yeah. in germany i think the situation is okay the mm -hmm. states I yeah i would say canada is one in canada i can't complain in canada relative yeah. to other countries anyway mm -hmm. but even then so i imagine that mm -hmm. how how much more challenging it might be for others in other countries where there's much less uh, support provided and much less time given definitely that's why grants like that are so so important mm -hmm. okay so uh next let's hear from sonia yeah um well, um, I think what uh, what one should always uh, keep in mind is um, the part with, um, with which I started about the experiment. Yeah, it's not in, in, in general that you have uh, only people who discriminate and they are the bad people and you have the good people and they don't discriminate because in general we all think, yeah, we are on the good side. Um, I, I think every one of us, um, we, we grew up in, the, in this society and this society discriminates. So we should make um, us aware that we might discriminate also others. Yeah, it's not that because we are women, we don't discriminate and, and so on. And I also, for, for example, I experienced it um, myself, my, myself. I was um, yeah, it was a coincidence. I ended up in, in a uh, group of, of people. It was all about diversity. And then um, I started to, to try to share my opinion. Yeah, and I was very much suppressed by, um, uh, by white men. Um, but none of the black men um, backed up me. Yeah, no one. I only uh, received some backup from, uh, from women. This was also very, um, very uh, interesting experience. Um, and um, I also found out, um, for example, that uh, I don't know who of you knows this about this Harvard test where you can find out if you um, discriminate others. And I did it some 10 years ago um, already. 
and I found out that um, I don't discriminate um, black uh, people. Well, my grandmother is also a black, so this was not really astonishing for me. But um, what was kind of uh, shocking for me was that I slightly discriminated women in STEM. Yeah, engineer by myself, I was already engaged uh, very much to support um, um, younger um, women in this field. Um, and I was a little bit shocked and um, that I uh, slightly discriminated women in this field. That what I totally didn't want, but I think it does not help us if we try to ignore it, that we are all children of this society. And I think it's very important for leaders to accept it, that you might have a problem because otherwise you won't change anything. So, um, yeah, we, we talked um, about it um, already, leadership, but not only leadership, all of us yeah, might have a problem. The prob probability is very high that we might discriminate whatever group. Yeah, I don't know. Um, on the other hand, um, okay, it's a Berlin Science Week. And in Berlin, um, or in, in Germany at the moment, there's a big discussion going on about um, uh, board quota for women um, for uh, publicly listed um, companies. And recently it was announced that um, or, or 70% of the biggest um, German publicly listed companies announced that their goal to um, uh, yeah, that the goal to have um, women on their boards is zero. Yeah, the goal is zero. So as long as um, companies <laughs> yeah do not even try to change anything, how can we as a society expect that anything will change? So I think, um, yeah, and, and one of the main arguments is always we don't have enough um, women who are educated enough or who would really like to do it. Yeah, so if you are um, out there and if you're seeing this, just write to the um, German Minister of Economics, yeah, treat, um, treat them, treat him and, and tell him, well, I'm here. I'm willing uh, yeah, to, to become a board member because um, a lot of board members are not German in these companies. So if you're a woman, text uh, him and say, yeah, I'm willing to do it. We need your support because at the moment um, we have this law which is blocked by him and we would really like to have this um, uh, law um, get in, in, in place. Um, which would have a quota of 20%, yeah, which is not much, but it's more than zero. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow, I had no idea about that. That's so interesting and disappointing at the same yeah. time. I will definitely be tweeting after this event. Thank Why you. don't you, while we're going through Sarah's question, find that Twitter handle and t pop it in the chat for us all. I'm sure we would love to have it. Um, Sarah, I think you're the last one here, so go ahead with the question. And then after Sarah's answer, we're going to go quickly through the third so that we at least hopefully can get to one question from the chat. So go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, so I think a point that Sonia just made is really important that we all carry this un unconscious bias towards surely many different things in us. And it's really important, especially for people in leading positions, to um, educate themselves and increase their own awareness and also um, encourage people in their groups or in their in their institutions to also increase their awareness and actively fight these biases. Um, but I also agree with something that Lucy said that it's really essential that that the institutions will provide more concrete programs and means to really change something. Like talking about things is great, but we really need really need actions that 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 change something. And I think something that would also be very useful is, for example, to create some sort of working groups in, in uh, specifically in, in, in departments and to, to try and figure out what exactly the issues at that specific department are, because I'm sure it's also different from, from field to field and department to department, um, what the issues are, identify them, and then really actively work towards 
changing these um, these things. Um, but there's also so many other levels where, where things need to be done. Um, I recently heard about, um, for example, in textbooks, in, in physics textbooks specifically, there's still so many examples from, I don't know, from, from a completely different era, like very sexist examples of, uh, yeah, just for, for some, some physics questions, but with using, I don't know, some male dominated examples. And the only time that, that women appear in these old textbooks, or not old textbooks, actually even textbooks that are still published today, but then they use um, women as examples for, I don't know, um, dancing pirouettes or something, but nothing else. It's just something very like beautiful images of women for some things, but everything else is basically male dominated. And all this kind of contributes to this um, male dominated um, work culture or cultural in general in these fields. And I think, yeah, this also has to be actively changed. Um, yeah, I think those are great points, Sarah. And and things need to change. But for instance, the textbook thing that you mentioned, I had no idea about. I'm a, like in publishing. We are a publishing company. I find that concept that these types of questions would still be in books really interesting. And maybe I will go and look after and see what's on the markets and where these examples are coming from. Um, okay, so I think uh, we should head right into the third question while we still have some time, which is, what advice would you give to new students in STEM uh, about handling these issues in their workplace, whether that's within academia, in industry, in startup culture? Um, and what advice would you give to the professors and leaders? I think we've already hit on the leaders a bit. Educate yourself more and try to create top-down change, but yeah. So we'll go through again one by one. I'm just going random here. Let's start with Sonia this time. Sorry, I was just um, <laughs> writing something, um, some hashtags and so on in, in um, the uh, chat. So um, I was a little bit um, distracted. Yeah. My apologies. What advice would you really the? Um, my advice would be um, not to t um, tolerate any microaggressions or it's not um, only microaggressions what we have here, it's, it's real aggressions <laughs> what we have against minorities um, of every kind. And um, I totally understand it. Um, sometimes you are not that quick in this situation. Yeah, so then you're going home and then you think, oh, um, maybe I should have said something, but you're not that quick in, in these uh, kinds of, of um, things. So um, it's no problem at all. If you see these people the next time, bring up this topic again, yeah? It's your duty to do it. So um, you don't need them to start, yeah? You can, whenever you think it's the right time, you can start this topic because if it's important for you, you can speak out loudly and, um, say, okay, um, yeah, I, I, have, uh, I have a problem here, or I would like to, to bring up something that I would like to discuss. Even if it's not, um, even if nothing has happened, you can start this kind of discussion, just to, to make sure that there's an open atmosphere. And I think this is uh, something everyone can do, even if you're new to the group, you could just ask, okay, um, yeah, I'm thinking about this stuff. Yeah, I would like to, to have your experiences or your views on it and um, be prepared that it might hurt you what comes after this. Um, but try to not take it personally, but um, in a constructive way. Yeah, I, I totally understand it if one gets really angry. Um, but um, it's the same that I said earlier. Um, people in general who discriminate, they don't think that they are discriminating things. Uh, or other people, they think um, they are on the good side. Yeah, so it's very important to not make finger pointing or, or tell them, oh, you're a bad person. 
but to show them, okay, there might be a problem, yeah, because, yeah, all of us have this problem. So, yeah, this would be my advice. Yeah, I think that's really, really good advice. Be open to giving both the criticism when these microaggressions happen and taking it well itself if it comes back to you and learning how to change. Uh, Sarah, would you like to go next? Since you went last, last time I'll call on you earlier. <laughs> Sure. Um, yeah, so going something that was back to something that was said um, at the start of all this, um, I think V mentioned it, that uh, it's really important that when people speak up about something they experience, that group leaders or leaders in general take this seriously and just don't don't say like, um, yeah, just, you know, be nicer or just learn to live with it or whatever, whatever, but rather not just let them speak, give them a voice, but also believe what they're saying and um, accept it and try to yeah, do something to make the situation better for them. And um, yeah, then in, in general, I think also in like in, in, in the German speaking and in, in German speaking circles, I think it's also important, I mean, also in English speaking, but to use inclusive language, like gender neutral language and like in, in German specifically to use the female um, plural form and so on to just, um, especially in male dominated field, I think this, this just increases the feeling of that you're also actually included what's being said. And um, I guess this is true for the English language as well, where it applies to just to use yeah, gender neutral language. And also, also when, to my, uh, for example, inviting people to, let's say a Christmas party or something, if a group leader invites someone, be inclusive and say like, partners are also welcome, make it clear it's not just uh, like, I don't know, the husband of a woman that is invited, but also just, uh, yeah, kind of step out of the heteronormative world and kind of make sure that everyone knows that everyone is welcome. And um, this is actually, it might seem like not a big deal, but it does make a huge difference if, if it's just vocalized that this is, uh, that actually everyone is welcome. And um, yeah, so I think, and also specifically, maybe a, a group leader could, could encourage people and also they themselves could attend um, a, a workshop on diversity and really educate themselves. I don't know, learn about pronouns and um, yeah, really specifically try to improve their own behavior. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And especially that one about just being open and saying all partners are welcome to the person giving that information. Like it seems so minor, but to those receiving it, on the other end, it really can make a huge difference. Um, next, why don't we hear from Sandy? Um, so I just wanted to touch on the um, importance of allies. So this relates back to something that Sonia mentioned um, in her example that she gave. And that, um, yeah, I definitely agree with her in the way that we need to be um, uh, courageous and brave and speak up when we can do, but be wary that yes, it can also um, come back at you sometimes and make your life hard. So in those situations, sometimes it can be really worthwhile finding an ally. And that's someone that you feel safe with um, to talk about these issues, who um, hopefully agree with, who agree with you on these issues, and can also stick up for you and, and vouch for you um, when you are sort of speaking up. And um, also that kind of um, relates to the thing that Sometimes if someone does speak out, then if you can be, also be an ally for others. Um, so in that example where um, that Sonia gave of, of her male um, and black counterparts not standing up for her, um, I think she would feel much more valued in that situation if, if they were. Um, and, but of course, it, it, it is a difficult situation and, and people need to, to act on their level of comfort as well. Um, and that sort of leads me to the, my next point, which is that um, all of these changes that we want to make, unfortunately, they are slow, um, but it is a, a very worthwhile fight. And in no way are we going to keep fight, keep stop. Sorry, are we going to stop fighting? Um, but in, if order, in order to keep fighting, we also need to take care of ourselves um, so that we can also take care of others. So always remember to, to, yeah, to also take care of yourself in, in this long fight. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. A lot of people in this panel, I'm sure, sit on many working committees around this issue, and you really can get a lot of fatigue on this. 
and, and learning how to be a good ally and find good allies is really key to self-preservation. Uh, next, why don't we hear from Clemens? All right. Also a difficult question. I was wondering what advice to give to uh, new students because um, I'm also teaching with a colleague a seminar called Hacking Innovation Bias at the Technical University of Berlin. And it happens in each term that uh, there are uh, female students sitting in it who are already fed up with uh, STEM even before they receive the master's degree. Um, so I'm uh, struggling a little bit with myself also what to, to give for recommendations for them. Um, so I think uh, one issue is to increase institutional awareness, to bring it up uh, to leadership, your, your question. And uh, I try to give two practical um, recommendations. One is that maybe storytelling, um, giving extreme insights into what is going on, what is happening, uh, could help to, to raise awareness. Uh, for problems and the other thing is that um, yeah, organizations are uh, bureaucracies so you have to be bureaucratic um, if something happens to you some social misconduct you have to kind of uh, yeah, list it file it even with the date to describe what's happening if it's continuously happening and uh, this will help you to bring it up and also raise uh, relevance and um, awareness uh, among leaders um, another important aspect that I want to uh, say is um, that students should have in mind that, uh, that they try to build a critical mindset and have in mind that most methods, technologies and standards they are being taught uh, in STEM are created from them because they're in, during the last two centuries there were mostly men uh, in the field with having men in mind. So what are examples for this? Uh, so the reference masses of crash test dummies are uh, male. Um, body masses for tools or work uh, safety clauses are male. Uh, even samples in, in, in the medical sciences are uh, sometimes prepared without having females in it. And uh, even, even a field like graphic planning is a field where they use data uh, which have a male prototype in mind. and. Uh, go to male needs when traveling uh, in the morning to the work and not having in mind that people maybe have to fetch their children from childcare, bring them there, have care duties uh, in the family and so on. So uh, you could criticize this in your faculty, you can criticize this uh, in school. Uh, once you see that reference material or pedagogical approaches um, are gender blind somehow, and uh, another thing is that, you, that students should, who, who experience discrimination should always keep in mind that they are not the cause of discrimination, um, but the system is it. And uh, yeah, as it was told, seek allies to bring up your issues. Yeah, all great insight. I feel like you just gave a lot of information, but yeah, it was all amazing. Next, why don't we hear from B? Yeah, I agree. Everyone Absolutely, gave, I guess. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Everyone gave really great um, advice already. And I guess, you know, I wanted to build on uh, what Sonia said, definitely speaking up. Sometimes we think that might not make a difference, but you can see how just sending, you know, spreading ideas out there, they do impact people, even when you think they might not. So I think speaking up is really important. And what Sandy said about really taking care of yourself too, because you don't want to let these things eat you up. Because at the end of the day, we went into the STEM field because we love the truth. We love science. We want to make an impact. And so for myself, I guess I would share that, um, you know, all the times that I've been told that I shouldn't be doing this or I can't do this or I'm not good enough or I need to do more or do better. <laughs> you know, like those things, they were hurtful, but at the same time, I think they motivated me. And uh, being a first generation college student, I really didn't have, you know, like an understanding of what college was about or doing a PhD or being a professor. And maybe like Lucy, I also didn't have exact clear role models to say like, hey, this is how I can be a, an academic. And so I would say that you can pave your own way, um, the same way that Sonia has, for example, you don't have to fit a model. And in fact, we can't, right? Um, like I don't have the same sort of, uh, 
you know, way of influencing my students that, you know, Bob Bergman, who's like the father of organometallic chemistry can. And so I really had to find my own style and my own voice. And there might not be the mentors out there who you need. And so I'll give you the advice that I sort of felt has been successful for me is to just read widely. There's great books and resources out there. And if you want to learn more about how to do better at science, you can read a book about like how to better understand equations, or you can read a book about how to write scientific uh, prose, or you can read a book about how to be a better public speaker. And so I think that we also have access to, to mentors through reading. And so I want to encourage everyone to like also care for yourself and your own personal development and find your own voice because we need diverse perspectives and we need um, people who really want to make an impact and make it and do it their own way. And I think we're starting to see that right now with a change in the culture of what it means to be a scientist, right? It doesn't have to be sort of the stereotypical vision that uh, we've been sort of given all of, all of this time. Wow, yeah, that was really, really powerful, Vee. Thanks so much for that answer. I, I echo everything that you said. So looking at the time, I think I'm not gonna talk so much and let's just move on to Lucy. Would you like to go ahead and answer the question? Yeah, so a lot has been said about sort of um, advice to students and um, in, uh, new students in STEM. Um, so um, I want, just wanted to make an additional comment um, well, in agreement with what others have said about advice to like the professors, the group leaders, and so on. Um, especially those who are um, men, uh, maybe white people, and so on, and maybe in their day-to-day -day lives don't experience the systemic uh, the, um, issues that um, women, people of color, and um, maybe um, people in the um, LGBTQ community, um, disabled people and others might experience. So um, I would say educate yourselves to those people because and in, in a way educate yourselves to have a better understanding of other people's perspectives because you may think it may, uh, may feel that oh I'm a man I'm not I'm not um, um, I'm completely supportive of women I'm not um, sexist or anything of the sort or oh, I'm a white person I'm not racist and that's the thing that I hear all the time 99% of white people would say I'm not racist uh, and so um, th th therefore you assume no one else is and so um, you kind of don't really get a good understanding of um, the issues that others might be experiencing and so that's come up a lot in the uh, with regard to the race issues in the past um, six months of course uh, but all, and also with regard to women and gender issues over the past number of years in connection with the me too movement and so on so uh, i would say for those who are even if you are not in a situation where you might be experiencing any kind of systemic discrimination you should educate yourself especially if you are you are not in that type of situation uh, educate yourself yourself in order to be actually helpful and be an ally and um, then you can you are in a position to promote diversity and equity and so on and also yourself be able to mentor students even if you are like you can be a man but still mentor uh, women students and so on but in order to do so effectively you have to be um, to have um, well, to, to, to have an understanding of what the issues are. And many, if you, are, you don't need to, you may not feel that you have to. You might just be, um, well, things look okay to me, like what V mentioned earlier, things look okay to me. Um, it be look, looks like, um, it's sort of like how people felt in 2008 when, it, at least in the United States and many other countries, it was felt, well, we are going into this post-racial situation now we've got this great black president and so on but well things haven't really changed so i would say the same thing with other diversity issues yeah i think that's really great advice especially you know me i i'm a white woman i will never understand those issues of discrimination around race i need to listen to voices like lucy's and voices like others on this panel in order to get the empathy required to handle this topic and I think it's really powerful to be, you know, actively anti-racist, 
anti-discriminatory on all of these issues, on all of these intersections. Um, and that's the only way we're really going to change the field. Um, I think we do have some time for maybe one or two questions. Kevin, do you want to pull one from the chat or should I? You're on mute. <laughs> I can't hear you, Kevin, you're on mute. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I think we've got four questions. I'll just dive into Jovan's questions. I hope sure. I pronounced his name correctly. Um, question about diversity statements at academic institutions. Are they actually disingenuous, being rather statements and less actions being taken to improve diversity for all discriminated groups? Um, okay. Yeah, so maybe whoever, now that we're in this kind of open question period, whoever wants to tackle a question, just raise your hand and unmute and we can go forward there. Or I guess just, oh, oh I saw Clemens first. <laughs> go for it, Clemens. Uh, thanks. Well, I think, they, I think they are important because it's a thing you can relate to if something happens to you. Uh, then you can go to your superior and say, um, I happen to be discriminated. We've got this code of conduct where it's uh, stated that we don't allow um, discrimination in our research organization. So it's a precondition um, for, for uh, yeah, bringing issues up and making them relevant. Um, but yeah, one have to uh, differentiate between the talk and the walk. And uh, of course, as Jovan implies it uh, with this question, um, it's two very different uh, things. And in most organizations, it's not uh, actively lived uh, what is written in the code of conduct. Would anyone else like to go ahead and answer this? Sandy? Yeah, can I just add here that um, I don't think that these um, types of statements are disingenuous, but I think the question is really, are they effective? And the answer the, to that is probably no. <laughs> um, and that we do need to have more concrete plans of how institutions can, um, yeah, can actually initiate change. Um, I also wanted to bring up, so there's an initiative um, that came out of the UK called the Athena Swan Program, and it's been adopted by a number of different countries. And I find this program really um, cool in the way that um, basically it, it, it puts an assessment on, for example, universities or uh, research institutions and um, gives them a rating. And you're either kind of bronze, silver or gold status. And um, that rating is based on gender equity and all sorts of other um, diversity um, uh, requisites. But um, basically, if you only have a, a if you don't qualify for one of these um, um, rankings, then your ability to apply for funding as an institution can be capped or can be lessened. So there's actual incentive to improve these diversity measures in, um, within your institution because then you have more access to funding. So it actually puts a real pressure on institutions and bodies to, to improve. And so I think this is a really great initiative. I hope it gets adopted in, in a lot more places, but hopefully things like this, um, yeah, uh, become more, more commonplace. Yeah, I think that's an amazing program and it really puts external pressure on institutions, which I think is what is required to hopefully enact some change. Would anyone else like to go ahead and answer this? I see Lucy. Um, yeah, so, so um, um, I would agree that I, I don't think they're disingenuous, but um, I, I, and, but they, may, they do need to be effective. So they need to be, as I already said, concrete um, programs in place and so on to support whatever the statement is um, claiming. But um, I do think it's better to have them than to not have them. So if they didn't, so, so they do, they, they are important in the sense that at least they give us some expectations that we, we, we for our institutions to uphold and some rules that we can refer to. And then we can, without having a statement to say what the expectations are, it would be a lot harder to actually get anything done. We need to know what the problem is or to have some statement of what the expectations are as to how we might solve our problems, solve the related problems. Yeah, I think I agree. So basically what we seem to be discussing here is like these statements are important groundwork, but they really need to be built upon in order to be effective. 
Uh, v, I know your camera's not on. If you want to answer, just unmute and go ahead. Uh, if not, we, uh, Sarah I, and Sonia, I didn't see you raise your hands at any time. I don't know if you want to answer or we can go and try and tackle another question with the time we have left. Yeah, no, I, I agree every, with everyone. I think the statements are really important and I would be worried about institutions that don't have one because it demonstrates that it's hard for them to get one together and have a common goal. Yeah, cool. I realized actually we have three minutes left. I don't know, Kevin, do you think we have time for another question or should I go and start wrapping things up? Uh, I think it's great for us to, I, I, we can summarize one question. Basically it's about how do we actually deal with discrimination most of this are being affected by the affected groups that are there, you know? It could be our sexual orientation or our language, you know? So how do we actually convince or sort of like narrate this sort of dialogue in a very like constructive manner? And lastly, actually it's for me personally, um, I do feel like this discussion has come across into a very Western and European perspective. And I do believe that we have also audience coming from countries where, you know, they are persecuted for being minorities. What kind yeah. of advice would you give actually to them? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, would anyone like to go ahead and tackle the questions that Kevin just said? Again, you can raise your hand or be, feel free to unmute. I, I didn't really understand the question. Could you repeat it? Yeah. Uh, basically, if you think about being a researcher in countries where you are might be persecuted, as a sexual minority group or religious minority and so forth, how would you sort of um, find the right balance or to make yourself feel safe to talk about it freely? And I do believe that in institutions, I mean, I can speak for myself in Indonesia that people are quite liberal in terms of these topics, but uh, due to legal issues, you know, it would be very, very difficult for you to do so as a professional. Mm -hmm. So how would you sort of like, what kind of advice to these yeah. people, you know? Uh, that we would get. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, Sonia, and then we'll go to Sarah to wrap it up. Yeah, um, I, I think it's very, very difficult um, um, uh, for us to really think um, to, to be in an environment where you are not allowed to speak out what you um, what you want um, to say and not to ask for for, for tolerance and everything. So um, it's, it's um, t totally difficult um, to even imagine how um, cool and how, um, how, yeah, how uh, sad this must be. Um, I think one way could be um, if you know about this Tor browser, it's a way to en enter the internet in an un anonymous um, way. And there, um, yeah, you, you could um, download it, no one can track you, and maybe it's a way to find alleys um, where you could, um, could exchange in a, in a safe room. Yeah, um, this would be the only advice um, that I, uh, I, I could give you. Um, it's uh, very, very difficult to imagine that you don't know who you can trust, who you can share your thoughts with. Um, yeah, our thoughts are with you guys. It's, um, we, are, we are privileged that, um, that we can do it um, nowadays. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great question and great response, Sonia. Uh, Sarah, would you like to also contribute? Yes, so my advice would also be to um, find a community online probably would be the safest way then in, in such a case. Um, yeah, find a, a queer community to connect with and just to yeah, exchange, ex exchange ex experiences and feel less alone. We've actually had with this, this group that I'm part of, LGBTQ STEM Berlin, we've had people actually contact us from countries where they can't be openly out and um, they've contacted us and said like they can't, yeah, nobody can know about this, but they would like to connect with us and now, since, um, since the start of COVID-19, we've had our meetups online, actually, on, on Zoom as well. And um, this now gives people like that a po the possibility to, to join us, actually, connect with us. And um, yeah, in a way that, of course, these, these, these uh, meetings are, are um, with invite only and so on. So it's, um, I would say, relatively safe and gives them an opportunity to still connect with the queer community, even though they can't do this in person maybe and can't do this um, yeah, the way they should ideally. 
but I think this, um, yeah, this is my advice. Find, find, yeah. somehow find like-minded people and really uh, find a support system. Mm -hmm. Have you found at those uh, events that you've been having that you've gotten global participation or is it still mostly Berlin-based? It's mostly Berlin-based, but it's become like a few global um, Interesting. people too. And we're definitely, I mean, especially as long as we're doing online meetings, um, of course, anyone's welcome. It's great to have people from all over join. Amazing. Okay, well, I think we're actually technically two minutes over. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panelists for contributing today. I think that everything that we discussed was really important and hopefully really helpful to the participation uh, participants that were watching. Um, to all panelists, if you have anything you want to link or plug, feel free to toss that in the chat so that everyone can reference to it later. Or I think because this is a registered webinar, I'll have an email list so I can circulate the transcript and some additional links later. Um, and yeah, I think that's pretty much it from me. Thank you so much for coming. A big round of applause to all of our panelists. And I hope you stay positive and test negative in this crazy time. So with that, bye.